We have a lot of things to be praying for these days. There's a lot that's on our heart and minds, and they're big deals, life and death situations. If you know someone who is struggling to breathe because of the coronavirus, that is a big prayer. We also have prayers for people's survival. I have family members, maybe you do too, who've lost their jobs as a result of this virus. And these big prayers are on top of all the other things that we've been praying for normally before this virus made its way to shore and landed in our homes. So we've got big prayers, needing big responses. But what should we hope for when we pray? What does God do in response to our prayers? I think that this passage we read this morning, John chapter 11, this conversation between Martha and Jesus can help open our eyes to what happens when we pray and shape our expectations of what God might do. The story kind of reads like a prayer. Martha and Mary have an urgent need. Their brother Lazarus is dying. He is ill and is actually nearing death. So Martha sends off an urgent message to Jesus. It's short, like a telegram, because there's no time to waste. It simply says, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Stop. This feels a lot like a prayer. Jesus isn't in town, so they can't go and find him. All they can do is write down their request and throw it on the wind of prayer and hope it gets to Jesus in time for him to act. Since the story reads like a prayer, let's see what happens to this prayer. But first, let's take a look at the prayer itself. Lord, he whom you love is ill. What do you notice about that prayer? It's short, isn't it? It's urgent. Time is of the essence. It's to the point. But it's also beautifully intimate. Did you notice that Martha did not even make a request? All she did was tell Jesus that Lazarus was ill. It was enough for her to call upon the love of Jesus for her brother and to trust that Jesus would know the right thing to do. It makes me wonder if this isn't perhaps the simplest and purest form of prayer possible. In these few words, Martha summarizes what is truest. Jesus loves Lazarus. And because Jesus loves Lazarus, he would want to know if something was wrong. It was okay for her to send this message. It was okay for her to pray. And because Jesus loves Lazarus, he could be trusted to act out of tenderness and compassion as he responded to what Lazarus needs. Is this not all we need to know in order to pray? Do we just need to be reminded that Jesus loves us and that he would want to know our concerns? And because he loves us, we can trust him to bring about all of God's goodness in response to our needs? Our prayers don't have to be long and sophisticated. Going on and on when we pray doesn't make our prayers more worthy. We may not even need to have a specific request. We can simply call upon the love of Jesus for ourselves or for others and then wait. Wait for how God will respond. Which brings us to the second phase of prayer. Waiting. When Jesus got the message from Martha, even though he loved Martha, he chose to stay two days longer where he was. And so the waiting of prayer began. Martha had to wait not because Jesus didn't care about her, but because Jesus had a plan. A plan that was wilder and more wonderful than Martha could have imagined. Martha couldn't see that. 
All she could see was that her brother was actively dying. In fact, he probably died the same day she sent the message. All she could see was that she needed Jesus now and they'd better hurry before it was too late. But Jesus and the Father could see something more amazing than Mary. They could see a way that they could help Lazarus while also leading Martha to believe more fully who Jesus was, while also stirring faith within Mary and Martha and the crowds, and while also beginning to conquer death itself once and for all by triggering the reactions of the religious leaders that would lead to Jesus' arrest and crucifixion. Jesus could do all these things if he didn't come in time to save Lazarus from dying so that he could come instead to raise him from the dead. So spoiler alert, this is how the story ends. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead and it's told in just two verses of this entire chapter because the purpose of Jesus' miracles were not the spectacle itself, but what these miracles might do in the lives of people who saw them. Jesus could perceive all of this instantly when he got the message, when he got the prayer from Martha. He turned to his disciples and told them what God intended to do. God intended to bring glory to the Father and to Jesus through this. Martha couldn't see any of this. She had no idea of the activities of love that Jesus had set in motion behind the scenes. She didn't know what Jesus was thinking. She didn't know what Jesus was doing. All she could see was that he wasn't coming in time. That's the predicament of prayer, isn't it? We telegraph our urgent pleas for help, and then we have to wait. And while we're waiting, we can't hear what God is thinking. We can't see what God is doing behind the scenes. We can only tell if God shows up in time and does the things that we ask God to do. We don't like waiting, especially when our prayers are urgent, when there's no time to waste. If we're kind of honest with ourselves, our prayers are always urgent because we're not good at praying. We don't know how to pray unless time is against us and we don't know how to solve something on our own. Then we begin to pray. And our prayers often sound like this. God, I'm sorry I waited so long to pray, but could you hurry up and answer right now? But the story that plays out like a prayer tells us we can take heart even while we're waiting. Because while we're being asked to wait longer than we think possible, Jesus is is preparing a response that is more amazing than we could imagine. When Jesus finally arrived, he took up this prayer. He took up this conversation with Martha. Martha spoke first. She said, if you'd been here, Lord, my brother would not have died. What's the emotion you hear in those words? If you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Is that lament? Is that sadness that Jesus couldn't simply get back in time? Is it frustration? Why did you wait? Is it anger? Why did you go so far away to begin with? Why were you not here when we needed you? Whatever emotion is behind those words, it was acceptable in her prayer. Jesus didn't rebuke Martha. He didn't tell her she was being disrespectful or that she had a lack of faith. And Jesus doesn't rebuke us for praying our emotions, whatever that emotion in the moment might be. Because emotions that express how we're feeling are a part of the conversation of prayer. Jesus is always willing to hear what's on our heart and what's on our minds when we pray. So Martha not only prays her feelings, 
she also prays her faith. She goes on to say, even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. You see, having these complex and competing emotions when we pray doesn't mean we don't believe or that our faith has collapsed. It just means we don't understand everything that is happening around us. We see Jesus welcoming us in all of our confusion when we pray. He doesn't get frustrated. He doesn't tell us to get our act together. Instead, Jesus just continues the conversation with us. Jesus began now to prepare Martha for what he was about to do. Jesus said, your brother will rise again. Martha thought that Jesus was just offering her some kind of simple comfort, a simple Jewish sympathy. Kind of like saying, well, there's always the hope of heaven, you know, which Martha didn't find very satisfying. She said, yes, Lord, I know my brother will rise again on the resurrection on the last day. To which Jesus said, no, 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 you misunderstood me. I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. By saying this, Jesus was promising that when you and I die physically, we'll be raised on that last day, the great resurrection, we'll be raised and given new life again, new bodies. Jesus went on to say, those who believe in me and live will never die. He was saying that this life with God we enjoy now, nothing can interrupt that, not even death. And then to get Martha ready, he said, do you believe this? He's trying to get her ready for what he was about to do, and he wanted her to see the significance of what he did when it happened. Well, as I told you, this story ends with resurrection. After telling Martha what Jesus could do for her, he then demonstrated it. He went to the tomb where Lazarus had been buried. It was a cave. There was a stone rolled in front of it. Jesus told him to roll away the stone. And Martha hesitated for a moment. But Jesus reassured her. And so she instructed them to roll away the stone. And then Jesus shouted with a voice loud enough to wake the dead, Lazarus, come out. And he did. He came out doing the dead man shuffle because his legs were wrapped tight with grave clothes. Jesus said, unbind him and let him go. What an amazing answer to Martha's prayer. So if John 11 is kind of a window into the conversation of prayer, what happened there? Martha prayed briefly, intimately, she trusted Jesus. Martha waited while Jesus set in motion a response that was wilder than she could have imagined. Jesus and Martha continued that conversation of prayer as he prepared her for what he was about to do. Then Jesus acted. Lazarus came back to life. Martha believes. And Jesus begins his act of securing resurrection forever for all of us. Let's go back to those big prayers that are weighing on your heart and your mind today. Those big prayers that need a big response. We've learned from Jesus that we can have the courage to pray even for big things and our prayers can be short and simple as long as we're trusting his love. We've learned that we might be asked to wait but if we are, it means that Jesus is assembling a response that is bigger than we imagine. We might expect an ongoing conversation with Jesus as he prepares us for what he intends to do. And finally, we're encouraged to look for signs of resurrection and life in whatever answer Jesus gives us. So how about if we practice that? 
right now. If we practice that with one of those big prayers that's been weighing down your heart, bring one of those to mind and I'll guide you. What have you been praying for? Pray simply. Lord, the one whom you love needs. And then finish that sentence. Lord, the one whom you love needs. And if you have a specific request you'd like to add at the end of this sentence, do so. Otherwise, just say, Lord, the one whom you love needs you, trusting that Jesus will know the right thing to do. Pray simply. Then trust. Release this prayer to God as you wait for an answer. Don't let the press of the clock or the calendar shake you. Jesus has all of that in mind as he's preparing his response for you. And while you're waiting, listen. Listen to how the Spirit might be preparing you for what Jesus wants to do. Maybe you'll be reading a scripture or having a conversation with a friend, and then a whole new thought about what you've been praying for comes to mind. If that's true, then Jesus is continuing that conversation. Pick up that thought and continue to pray about that. Finally, watch. Whenever you sense that God is beginning to answer your prayer or has answered it in full, watch for evidence of resurrection, of how something you thought that was lost forever, a relationship, a desire, a hope, might now be possible again. And watch for signs of life, some way, some way in which you feel invited to experience more of God's goodness in your life right now. Resurrection and life, those are probably going to be in every answer to prayer that Jesus gives you. All of the aspects of this conversation, this prayer between Martha and Jesus, that's what Jesus intends to be part of our conversation with him. I invite you to take him up on it. To pray those big prayers simply with trust, listening, and watching for signs of resurrection and life. Amen.